Okay, uh, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, we have uh, Dr. Stern uh, returning uh, to do a talk on the United States and China, um, the contest for power that is going on between the two. Um, Dr. Stern has given us excellent lectures before, so I'm proud to introduce them. Um, Dr. Stern received his PhD from the University of Rochester in 1970. Since then, he has written volumes of papers on the political parties, the modern presidents, and the Holocaust. He also authored Calculating Visions, Kennedy, Johnson, and Civil Rights. He was Vice President for Academic Affairs and Professor of Political Science at Shepherd University, a 130-year-old liberal arts institution near Washington, D.C. Um, prior to that, he was a professor at University of Central Florida, where he founded the UCF Honors and Scholars Program in addition to teaching political science. He is also an em emeritus professor at Arizona State University. Um, so Dr. Stern, thank you very much for returning. Um, and with that, I will hand it off to you. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here again. And uh, your computer is taking over my, uh-oh, he went off. The meeting being recorded is at the center of my computer, and if you turn that off, I'll be able to see more people. Oh, does it have a button where you can click, uh, like, got it or something? Let me see what we have here. More. Oh, there it is. Got it. It's okay. at the bottom. Got it. Okay. Well, I'm delighted to be back. My subject is very different from the last time, so let me give you some background. Um, I, about seven years ago, had a very good friend who was a Chinese scholar. And as we talked, I got very interested in China. And I spent the following seven years reading. I don't do Mandarin, but there are lots of English translations of major articles and books on China not just written for the U.S., but written in China. Um, and about four years ago now, I gave the course for the first time called The Rise of China. And it basically is going to, I'm going to give a synopsis of it to you today and talk some more about what's happening now. Um, and then uh, I gave a course for Brandeis University um, on the rise of China. And the last year or two, I've been looking at the shift that's gone on uh, since the Biden administration especially has come into power. And that's now become the center because that has become the focus of the confrontation between the two nations. Um, and I'll talk about that. Um, I'm particularly interested in how this confrontation came about and it's sharpening under Biden and where it can go. But for today, I'll talk about the background to kind of bring everyone who is here uh, into an awareness of what China sees. I think the great weakness for the American public is their lack of understanding how China sees us and their perception of the US created confrontation. In fact, in the November meeting that um, Xi held with Biden, when Xi was speaking, he talked about China's support for more open trade policies rather than the U.S. creative protectionism. And quote, the world is big enough for the two countries to succeed. Xi is only too anxious to lower the tone of confrontation. The U.S., on the other hand, has in fact been the creator of this tone uh, in recent years. And I will be glad to discuss that. Um, and I think it is a tone that is set in the context of China's incredible growth and what we take as a threat from China. Um, 
and that's probably most visible to the public in the technology uh, restrictions we've now placed on Chinese trade. But let me go and talk a little about where China comes from and how they see things. Um, in 1949, that's a while back, that's when I uh, was only 80 years old at the time. And in, and in 1949, Mao took power from Chiang Kai-shek. And in his first speech at Tiananmen Square, his very I'm first public speech, to my ear. he talked about, this marks the end of the era of humiliation. And Xi, from Mao to Xi, that has been repeated time and again and again. And I wonder how many of you know what he's referring to. Now I'll tell you a second thing. When Xi becomes the head leader in 2012, the very first thing he does is he takes the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party of the Politburo to a museum in Beijing which is dedicated an exhibit to the era of humiliation. The confrontation over Taiwan stems from the era of humiliation. And yet Americans have no idea that that's what Taiwan is about for the Chinese. And what they mean by this is from the time of the Opium War until a hundred years later, the Chinese were effectively cut up by the Western powers in Japan, where the Western powers forced the opening of ports, forced the importation of opium, took control of countries, of the lands of China, such as Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan in 1895, taken by the Japanese, and had the session areas on mainland China in the major port cities. And though you may have learned US history, as we were there to help China keep its trade open, what the Chinese know and learn, as the US had military encampments in China, in their session areas in Shanghai and Tianjin. And to this day, you can go to Tianjin and see the US military marine barracks there and the US military presence on those session areas. The European countries, the US and Japan had sovereignty. The judicial system, the police system, the military, the educational system were controlled by the outside powers. And what's important about that is that Hong Kong reverted to China in 1997, but Taiwan remains outside of China. And before Clinton could visit China, Before he was able to visit China, the negotiations with Kissinger were almost solely centered on Taiwan. That the US had to agree to a final statement at the end of the first conference of Mao and Nixon. Their final statement was that there is only one China and the People's Republic of China is China. And the U.S. said that. And to this day, that is the official U.S. position. For China, here's what happened. 1949, Chiang Kai-shek flees to Formosa, Taiwan. When he does, the Chinese are ready to move over there and finish off the Civil War victory. 
the U.S. sends a seventh fleet in and stops it. The last unredemptive piece of China from the era of humiliation remains Taiwan, protected from Chinese invasion from the People's Republic of China by the United States. What China sees is a lost territory taken by the West from it. Because it was the U.S. that intervened. Because right after World War II, Taiwan was handed back to China when Chiang Kai-shek was in power. And so it became again part of China. And then comes the Civil War ending, and it's no longer a part of China because the U.S. stopped the Chinese from taking it over. How many of you know that story? That is the reason why it's so critical to China. It's not about Taiwan Semiconductor. It's not about we want to grab this island off the coast. It's about China's absolute commitment to end that era of humiliation in finality. And as long as Taiwan sits out there protected by the United States, that era is not over for them. Any questions? Let me go to the next stage of this. When China and the U.S. agreed on the truce in Korea following the Chinese invasion when the U.S. marched up to the Yellow River, when the Chinese did that, they were moved into isolation by the U.S., Few countries outside the satellite countries of Russia recognize China. The U.S. essentially put an economic cordon sanitaire around China so it could not trade with the rest of the world, as with the Soviet Union. And there were only two times when the Chinese delegation left China for an international conference. The first time in 1954 was the Geneva Conference. And the Geneva Conference was about settling the French Indo Chinese War. And the US and China, as well as Russia and France and the Vietnamese, signed an agreement for a temporary border demarcation for one year. And at the end of that year, there was going to be elections. And what happened, of course, is that the U.S. decided we would not hold elections. Eisenhower, in his book, Mandate for Change, says very openly, we understood Ho Chi Minh would win, and we weren't going to permit that. So Vietnam remained divided, and the U.S. incursion and then invasion ensued. At the Geneva Conference, when the Chinese Prime Minister went up to shake the hand and say hello to John Foster Dulles, he turned his back on him and would not shake his hand. That's how Chow An Lai was received by the US. So that's the end of the first Chinese overseas excursion. The second Chinese excursion was something the Americans absolutely have no memory of, but the third world has a great memory of, and it's part of what's moving the politics of the world today, including the defining of sides over Palestine and Israel internationally. That's the Bandung Conference of 1955 in Bandung, Indonesia. At that conference, which was only the second time the Chinese sent a delegation outside of China, the less developed countries, the third world, the southern poor regions, 
all met together to declare their commitment to staying out of the confrontation between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. China was there. It was there as a partner in solidarity to the former colonial nations. To this day, China sees itself as the leader of the anti-colonial nations, as the leader of the powers that want to change the Western controlled, Western dominated economic and international legal system. They believe that system has been set up and it actually has by the United States after World War II. And most of you probably have heard of Bretton Woods where the US set up the dollar as the international currency and the World Trade Organization was to come out of that and the Asia Bank later, but those are all Western or in the Asia Bank, Japanese, which is a Western nation viewed by the rest of the world. All those institutions, including the UN, were set up with the dominance of the West. And except for the UN right now, they still are dominated by the US and the European partners, including Japan, Australia, and China is the leader of the coalition that wants to undo that relationship. So that's another underlying issue that is there for reality. The anti-colonial movement, the anti-white European, that includes the US, colonial movement. And China sees itself as an absolutely valid partner in that movement and the leader. So how did China become the major player? Well, when one looks at it, in the year 2000, the US had about a third of the world's GDP. Remember after World War II, it was the only intact major industrial nation, by far the wealthiest nation in the world. So in 2000, it had a third of the world's GDP. China had two point, uh, over 2% 2 of the world's GDP. In the year 2023, the latest reports are the US almost 27%, China almost 18%, two thirds of the US. The major GDP power after the US is now China. And to put some more perspective on this, in the year 1800, and several major Western scholars have now reconfirmed this, in the year 1800, the two wealthiest nations in the world were China and India. By the end of the 1800s, they were poverty stricken. The West had taken away and plundered its resources of China and India. Mainly, of course, Britain, France, Portugal, the Dutch in East India. So there, there is very deep historic memories of China. And when Xi speaks about once again, being a world player and recognized, treated equally. He sees the demise of China by the West in the 19th century as leading to where he is now, bringing China back to its rightful place as a major power of the, of, of the world and the major power of Asia. So how did China get such great GDP? Let me show this to you, I hope I can. This is a graph of the GDP per capita in China from the year 
1960 to the year 2023. And the arrow that I have pointed there is the year 2000. And look at that takeoff. Part of the reason I'm not even worried about the specifics of this is I have a guy in my class who always complains I give too much data and talk about two particular points of data. You notice the people who are in my class are laughing. They may not see it quite the way I see it. Um, in any case, what that graph's inflection is about is two things. When Mao dies, in, nine, in 97, and Chow departs, there's a shift that starts to go on, and the shift finally results at that time in Deng becoming the Chinese leader. Deng pushes for an opening up of China to the world with trade. China is admitted into the WTO with the U.S. agreement. China receives most favored nation status, therefore, by the U.S. Now, most favored nation status just means that it's traded equally uh, like all other nations by the U.S. without punishing tariffs or impediments to trade that are not put on there uh, by, with other countries. So that moment is key because with that moment one has the rise of China. Deng puts in free trade zone areas, private trade zone areas and expands them as they become more and more useful to China. And Deng basically creates what I call a communist market economy, where private enterprise is treated with respect, is given the kinds of protections that we see in the West. And as a result, the Western capitalist nations see this huge market of over a billion people, and in they go. And with that, China makes a decision that its future wealth is dependent on employing its people in trade so that they can get the resources from a trade surplus to build China. And that is exactly what occurred. Unfortunately, part of what happened was that China took protectionist measures and right away, if one looks back historically at the U.S., the U.S. cheated and stole copyrights on steel manufacturing, trains. It grabbed them from Europe and helped develop the U.S. steel economy, the U.S. train system. And China became the 20th century version of that. Um, though we didn't like it, and finally, in 2018, Trump publicly put on tariffs to punish China for such bad behavior. In return, China put on tariffs not nearly as much as the U.S. had. And in 2022, the U.S. boycotted the Chinese Olympics, which was the Chinese mark of coming out to the world in full force of its technology and its uh, growth as a major power. While Trump put on the first tariffs, the Biden administration has been much busier in developing very pointed trade penalties for China. And the latest is, of course, you cannot use Chinese manufactured batteries or non-US 
automakers to get the 7,500 electric vehicle tax credit. That, of course, is to try and exclude the Chinese auto market from the US. And China has the largest auto manufacturing plant in the world. In fact, one company, BYD, has almost as many people employed manufacturing electric vehicles in China as the big three have all across the globe, the big three US automakers. I'm including Chrysler in there, though it's foreign owned now. The very first meeting between Secretary of State Blinken and China's chief foreign minister, Yang Zhizhi, on March 18, 2021, occurred in Anchorage, Alaska. At that meeting, which is the first Biden administration contact with high level Chinese, at the very opening, the American secretary gave a three minute lecture to the Chinese delegation telling them they were China was a threat to global stability, and that's a quote, denounced the US, the Chinese record on human rights, on trade, on interference with Hong Kong, on threatening Taiwan, as well as other mistakes it is making. China's Minister Yang responded with a 17 minute defense of China's right to non-interference, meaning the Uyghurs are a Chinese problem, not your problem. You have no right to criticize us on this. And he lambits the, the US's, quote, history of imperialism and racism, as well as its current racial unrest. This first meeting shocked the Chinese. They did not expect the American administration of Biden to be taking such a tough line. And they did. The Biden administration subsequently helped to organize efforts to punish Chinese officials for human rights violations across the globe repeated its condemnation of China's breaking of international norms and rules of behavior on trade, including those meetings attended by China. It lectured China again. China, in turn, mostly kept quiet, but condemned the U.S.'s aggressive behavior and still puts it at that point. Two weeks prior to the Alaska meeting, China's leader Xi Jinping bluntly stated, the biggest source of chaos in the present day world is the United States. He continued, the US is the biggest threat to our country's development and security. And he told the Chinese leadership, they must quote, grasp clearly that the East is rising, is rising while the West is declining. Xi, who is the absolute leader of China at this point, believes that the U.S. in particular and the West in general is in the throes of a continuous economic decline. And part of what China fears is that the U.S. in response to that decline will lash out to try and maintain its position as the world's largest power. In its 2018 National Defense Strategy Statement, the Trump administration took the position that one, the central challenge to U.S. Pr prosperity and security is, quote, the emergence of long-term strategic competition by both China and Russia. This was the first time that the U.S. had officially ch cited China as a central challenger to the US's primacy. The era of engagement with China in a positive way came at that point in a rather unceremonious close. 
National Intelligence Directives noted, quote, the People's Republic of China poses the greatest threat to America today. Beijing intends to dominate the US and the rest of the planet economically, militarily, and technologically. China should be America's primary national security focus going forward. That was December 4th, 2020, that the National Security Agency issued that report just as the Trump administration was leaving power. However, it wasn't just Trump that was shifting position. And this is something that's critically important to understand where Biden is. It was not just the Trump administration, but in the December 2020 report to Congress of the U.S. China Economic and Security Review Commission, a commission chaired by an appointee of the Republican Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, and having a co-chair appointed by the Democratic House Leader, Nancy Pelosi, their report states, China is engaged in a global competition for power and influence with the US. China, now, now compare this to Xi's statement just this past month, where Xi says there's room for the US and China as two growing economic nations. That isn't where the US sees this world. It's where China sees it. China has emerged, continued this joint report as an unprecedented economic rival and a growing military threat capable of inflicting grave harm on the US and its allies and partners. China's leaders have perceived the power gap, gap between China and the U.S. as steadily growing and closing. They have become increasingly confident in their ability to expand the reach of the Chinese Communist Party's values. China has turned the focus towards surpassing the United States, end of quote. So it's not just the president. It's both parties of the Congress that take the same position. Trump, Biden, in an article in Foreign Affairs published in March of 2020, that is headed, Why America Must Lead Again, Rescuing U.S. Foreign Policy After Trump, he stated, he plans to have a foreign policy that will win the competition for the future against China or anyone else. There is no reason we should falling be, be falling behind China. China represents a special challenge. Playing the long game by extending the global reach, promoting its own political model, and investing in the technologies of the future. That's where China is gone. The U.S needs to get tough with China. The most effective way, I'm quoting Biden still, to meet the challenge is to build a united front of US allies and partners to confront China's behaviors and human rights violations, even as we seek to cooperate on mutual interests and where we converge in interest with them. So what Biden in fact was forecasting before he took office was what has emerged. NATO has now added under Biden's tutelage China as an adversary. Never did that before. Biden has created military joint alliances and exercises with South Korea, Japan, Australia, and India, and the Philippines, all of which have now engaged with joint military exercises with the US. The US has a mutual defense pact with Japan and Australia and South Korea. And the Philippines, which had canceled their US air base earlier in the century, has now a naval base, has now put back the American bases in the Philippines under the Biden administration. 
So what China sees is the U.S. under Biden creating this pattern of encirclement militarily around its eastern and southern borders. The Biden administration's interim national security strategic guidance document, the March 2021, moved in concert with his prior article in Foreign Affairs. The document states, quote, the distribution of power across the world is changing, creating new threats. China in particular has rapidly become more assertive. It is the only competitive, potentially capable of combining its economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to mount a sustained challenge to a stable and international system, meaning a system controlled by the US. The White House issue statement continues, the alliances, institutions, and agreements and norms underwriting the international order that the US helped to establish are being tested by China. The agenda laid out in the national security document is intended to quote, allow us, the United States, to prevail in a strategic competition with China. Most recently, in February 2023, the National Intelligence Threat Assessment document concluded, quote, while Russia is challenging the United States and some norms in the international order in its war of territorial aggression, China has the capability to directly attempt to alter the rules-based global order and across multiple regions. The unveiling of this report followed Biden's March 12th meeting a week before in Anchorage. So I'm going to basically stop here. I don't want to go into details about what has happened. Basically, here's where the U.S. is versus China. The Chinese are in kind of a defensive position in terms of their saying repeatedly, look, we don't want an expanded confrontation with you, but we see you declining. And we're afraid that in your decline, you're gonna lash out. The US on the other hand says, we see you coming up. And what we don't want to have is you surpassing us. And so one of the ways the U.S. has taken this into account is creating this new series of alliances in East and South Asia. One of the other ways that it is taking this into account is to banning and having the Europeans ban Chinese access to the most advanced semiconductor processes in the world. And the U.S. is militantly engaged in confronting China everywhere that it moves on the globe. But at this point, China is moving ahead, most assuredly with what it calls the Belt and Road Initiative, where it has expanded its pipelines, its rail line from China into Europe its shipping lines and ports across the globe. And it has the biggest investment of $4 trillion that it has put into creating a worldwide network of trade alignments. So it can sustain its need for oil, foodstuff, minerals. And the U.S., right now is the reactive nation. So I ask who has questions. I now have left us a little under 20 minutes to talk, which I was asked to do. And I've met my part of the discussion. You now have to meet your part with questions. Okay, so go ahead and uh, you can either raise your hand or put your question in the chat. Um, we'll start with Marilyn, uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Dr. Stern, for such an informative uh, discussion. Anyway, my question is, and I think this is really a huge problem, is would, do you think, would the United
United States come to Taiwan's uh, to Taiwan's defense if China attacked Taiwan? Because I'm sure China is watching very carefully how we are handling Ukraine. And uh, Taiwan was a very important, dangerous issue in uh, China's relationship. That's what Xi, Xi said in their last meeting. That, that's what, so that's my question. That's what Xi has said forever. Taiwan is a critical part of the Chinese national agenda. It is the critical part of its relationship with the U.S. right now, as far as China is concerned. Our position has always been what we call strategic ambiguity. That is, we will not attack China in an offensive manner regarding Taiwan. As long as China does not attack Taiwan under the conditions set forth under the Nixon-Mao agreement protocols. That condition is Taiwan cannot move to declare its independence from China. If Taiwan moves to politically declare its independence from China, that will be a violation of the U.S.-China protocol, and China will consider it an aggressive behavior that warrants a military response. Taiwan hasn't have to make any offensive military response. It is Taiwan's political verbiage that they consider to be an offensive response. So Taiwan has avoided that. And what has really moved Taiwan in recent years was the Hong Kong takeover and the Chinese National Security Act of 2020. Basically, China had an agreement of Taiwan would have its own system of governance for internal needs. And as a sub part of China, it will respect Chinese law and sovereignty with regards to all else, including defense. When Hong Kong had street demonstrations protesting the Chinese taking security matters directly into Hong Kong, that's what stirred the national security law of 2020. And that law basically says Hong Kong is essentially now under Chinese direct rule. It has its own local legislature, but anything its legislature does has to be in conformance with Chinese law. That scared the wits out of Taiwan because what it meant was the Chinese had a treaty under which it took over Hong Kong that established two systems, one government, and China ignored it. Thus, when it would come to Hong Kong, how could, and China ignored the agreement, how would China behave with regard to Taiwan really coming under China? And the answer from the Taiwanese point of view is they will take us over totally as they did with Hong Kong. So militarily at this point, China has not said it will intervene unless the Taiwanese declare independence. And both countries have accepted that, though Biden three times now has made statements that have violated that agreement. Three times he has said, we consider Taiwan's defense to be America's defense. And words like that. Um, then the press secretary or others in the high up of the administration would walk it back. But when the Chinese see the former speaker of the house going to Taiwan last year, when they hear President Biden just making statements that are out of conformance with the written agreement that China had with the U.S., that gets the Chinese very angry. And so you see the overflights, 
you see the buildup of the military across from Taiwan on the Chinese mainland, and more and more the concern that the Chinese are threatening Taiwan. That's a long answer to your question, but it's the answer. I see. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, we have a question in the chat. I'll read that off. Then, Gary, we'll go with you. Uh, so the question in the chat says that Chinese aircraft have been very reckless flying very near U.S. routine aircraft. It would appear this shows China's action. Uh, but what would they say? And would you, okay. would you agree? Wonderful question. Very, very good question. In fact, when Biden met with Xi, the major agreement he got is to open up military communications again between China and the U.S. So that when incidents like that occur, the leadership can directly contact and make sure it doesn't get out of hand. Now, from the Chinese perspective on this, the Chinese see the U.S. as intruding into their territory in two ways. One, they have what they call the Nine Dash Line, which is a line that goes into the Eastern Pacific and around the south of China, close to the Philippines, um, west of Japan, over to the Philippines and across and over to uh, just south of Vietnam. And what China's, they claim that, now, what's very interesting about that line, though the U.S. says we don't recognize that. In fact, we did recognize that. Chiang Kai-shek declared that line when he was in power from 45 to 49. But once the communists took power, we no longer recognized it. Because under Chiang, we could move any and all military personnel around and in and have total control of that territory and not worry about the Chinese rhetoric. So now the Chinese say, wait a second, you're double talking. Of course, they never do such a thing. Um, but that's one way they see it. The second way they see it. And by the way, it's those confrontations, especially that are going on now around the Philippines that have gotten the Filipinos to bring in US military forces again and to do co-exercises with the US and Japan. The second thing that's going on is that the Americans routinely go right near the 12 mile line outside the Chinese maritime area. And they surveil China all the time. And it's the Chinese sending up planes to contest that. And the Chinese also sending up planes to contest the Nine Dash Line. And the Chinese sending ships towards the U.S. and other naval vessels. That leads to possible inadvertent military confrontations that may occur. That is what is happening. Basically, the Chinese say, you're in our territory. And even if we want to say, let's ignore all the nine dash line confrontations, you're in our territory, you're near our territory all the time, and we're going to try and stop you from, continu from continuously surveilling our territory. So one of the things the Chinese have now done is they've established a military base in Cuba where they can surveil the southern United States from Cuba. We haven't said much about that, but it's there. That answer your question? Yeah, I think uh, um, they had a follow-up one um, saying, do you agree that China's spy balloon is a clear example of their actions? Pardon me? Um, they had a follow-up saying, do you agree that China's spy balloon is a clear example of their actions? I don't know. I don't know what that spy balloon was about. In fact, I've heard, I've seen reports that um, Xi wasn't aware of the spy balloon. I'm not so sure of that, but that's the reports that have come. I, I, I don't know what that spy balloon was about. That is such, you know, we had the U-2 incident where Eisenhower apologized for the overflight so we can get the pilot back. Um, the spy balloon, I just don't understand it. And 
I think it was a spy balloon, despite all the nonsense that it was a meteorological balloon that went off course, because it did get steerage. So I'm not sure what the spy balloon was about at all. And I'm not sure we really have certainty over what it was about. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have one more in the chat, but we're going to go with Gary um, and then Stephen, you're next. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, I have uh, two questions. One, the up about the upcoming elections in Taiwan and what's the who are the candidates and what they stand for. Um, and, and sec, okay, go ahead and then I'll answer. Ask a second. Okay, one is the KMT party, which was Chiang Kai Shek's party, which is much more oriented to trying to develop a closer relationship with China. The other is the Democracy Party that Tsai currently uh, is president and her candidate is running Lai, I think his name is. And um, that party is the party that basically doesn't want to move with China. In fact, has more and more moved away from the economic relationship with China. Um, so the Chinese see the incumbent party as an adversary. Um, I do not believe that the incumbent party is going to be defeated. I think there's too much fear in Taiwan by its people about what a, what a close relationship with China may entail for the future. That's my answer. Okay, uh, second question. Um, COVID and their rea Chinese reaction to COVID uh, certainly weakened their economy. Do you think that uh, the, with this weakened economy that led Xi to try to be more moderate in his stance towards uh, the U.S. and Biden? I, I think Xi, from the time of the first blunt Trump tariffs through the much sharper curtailing of Chinese advanced trade with the U.S., China has wanted to open up trade with the U.S. and expand it. And it's very, very concerned that the U.S. has not been willing to do that. The, what, what happened with COVID is Xi made a very explicit policy, and I meant to look up this morning, and maybe somebody will while I'm still here, um, the percentage of deaths per million people from COVID in major nations. Now, while the COVID virus was rampant, China had the lowest rate of any nation. And Xi made a very explicit decision to close down China and save lives knowing it was going to have an effect, an adverse effect on the economy. Now that they've come out, they did have an explosion of COVID related deaths, but I'm not sure if it all still came to an approximation of the ratio in other advanced countries. If someone looks that up while I'm talking, it would be terrific that we get an answer to that. And that way I could make like I knew the answer because you'll get it. So please look it up, someone. Uh, what is the ratio uh, per 1 million people of COVID deaths in, in major nations, including China? That's, that's the thing to, to take a look at. Other questions? Uh, Stephen, you're on mute, but go ahead. I'll try to look that up if I can find it. Steve, I can't hear you. You have your uh, mute on. You have your mute on, Steve. All right, there it is. Okay, pardon me. Uh, do you think the, the U.S. may be overreacting to the competition, the economic competition with China, uh, leaving uh, leaving uh, tariffs on that Trump put on, to, which has cost uh, the U.S. Uh, in certainly in increased uh, costs of goods and services, and uh, which has also led to many states uh, 
uh, uh, preventing China from buying land, uh, uh, including the state of Missouri, which is trying to prevent uh, the purchase of land by the, uh, the state of China or China companies or something. And um, it just seems to me that, well, and then of course the, 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 uh, uh, the, the advanced microprocessors, which we have made unavailable uh, to uh, China. Perhaps we've overreacted a little bit. Well, um, there's a book called Chip Wars by Miller. Terrific book, the number one book. I have a couple of good friends who lived most of their careers in the semiconductor industry, and they swear by this book, and now I do. Uh, Miller, Chip Wars, um, where he basically argues, and I agree, it's going to take many, many years and likely never that China will be able to possess the level of advanced microchips that will be constantly moved forward by the U.S. and its Western allies because the processes and the costs of building it are so high that no one nation can do it alone. So, for example, you have uh, the Netherlands, which has the top secret photographic technique that's needed to put the microchips together working. You have Samsung uh, in Korea, South Korea, not letting it, the Chinese have access. You have ASML, um, you have Taiwan Semiconductor. They've all agreed to work with the US to stop Chinese access. Miller is convinced, and since I've read him and read a couple of papers critiquing his argument, I basically have come to agree. Uh, now for the US, there's two things at work here. One is security, which is what the Biden administration keeps touting out loud. And the second is economic well-being. China simply has the ability to use its technology resources combined with its economic resources to plan long-term in a way the US and the West cannot. Yeah. So let me give you the best example of that. When it comes to green technology, the Chinese are beating us, absolutely crushing us. Solar power, three quarters of the world's solar power comes out of China. China was the leading developer. Minerals necessary for battery creation. China owns much of it. Batteries themselves, China owns a majority of the production. Electric vehicles, China owns an overwhelming majority of production. China is building ports all around the world, taking long-term leases, building new ports to create these relationships with nations all across the world who ship it the raw materials it needs and in return get from China the building of their infrastructure. So there really is a global economic warfare going on and it's not one-sided. I don't think the Chinese consider it warfare. They consider it access to resources they need to survive long term. And so they built ports in South America, in Panama, um, in Europe, Greece's major GDP provider. I think it's like 15 to 20 percent comes out of the port of Piraeus, Chinese controlled. Um, China is heavily dependent on imported oil and gas. China is heavily dependent on foodstuffs and minerals being imported. And so China is building these ports all around the globe. And one of the things is that a number of these ports can also sustain military ships that come in for re equipment and adjustment. Um, China's Belt and Road Initiative is the largest planetary initiative by any nation historically. It is, it's almost overwhelming to see what Xi has put forward as China's agenda. It what is about, almost overwhelming. 
What about farmland in Missouri or, or other? Farms? Over in Arizona, too. And this is about states. It's about water. It's about, oh, they're building near military installations. Let's stop them. Um, there's all sorts of reasons. And over here in Arizona, it's not only about China, it's about Saudi Arabia using American water and American land to raise crops that they cannot sustain over in Saudi Arabia because they don't have the water. Mm -hmm. And so you get this nationalist response mm -hmm. uh, in our country to the buying of farmland and what it means for the country's well-being long-term. Okay, Dr. Stern, um, so I'll share this real quick. This is what I had found on, uh, can you see that chart on the, uh, no, I don't think you can. No, I don't see anything, Good. except the window. What about Before? now? Oh, there it is. Here okay, so is that kind of what you were looking for? Because you can see. Let's see. Attica, Oceania, South America, North America, Europe, Asia, except China. Look at China at the bottom. Yeah. We could do even better if we get the ratio of Chinese COVID deaths. But you could see how low it is. Mm -hmm. For a population that's over a billion people, that's probably one-sixth of the country, that is not 18% of your graph at all. It is amazing. But Xi paid a cost. And in fact, he opened it up when there started being demonstrations in major cities across China against the lockdown. But Xi was very, very explicit in what he was doing. And that's the result, such a low rate of deaths. And you can see when he opened it up, what happened, it came up. But it's still next to nothing compared to the rest of the world. Hmm. Thank you, whoever did that. That's wonderful. Um... Send that to me. Yeah, uh, yeah, no problem. Um, so um, last question, and then we'll have a, um, um, then we'll close up. Um, so regarding Taiwan, uh, the UK originally withdrew from a 50-year agreement that Taiwan should be a democracy for that time, and then ta Taiwan would return to China. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay, um, well, before we close, um, many of you know that Harvey Gerstein and Marilyn Alton um, host a political discussion program. Um, we have that next week on Tuesday at 10 a.m. Um, so, Marilyn, if you'd like briefly, just to take one second to say what you'll be talking okay, about. Okay, briefly, I haven't made the report, but it's going to be, should the Republicans block the advance of a, uh, a uh, billion-dollar package of funding for Israel and Ukraine because they want changes at the border. Number one, I wanted to discuss that. And number two, the two deans, the one from Harvard and the one from MIP, MIT, MIP, MIT, should they be dismissed? I wanted to discuss that and what's going on on the campuses. So that's the two things I would like to discuss um, on the 26th. Okay, thank you very much, Marilyn. And that is the Week in Review. Um, if you would like to sign up and you're not, um, you can reply to the email uh, as a reminder for Dr. Stern's class, and I'll sign you up. Um, and with that, Dr. Stern, again, that was every single time you deliver a fantastic question. Wonderful. Uh, hold okay. on one second. Uh, I'm also going to be speaking next week. And uh, my two top topics are going to be, where do we go wrong? The majority of Americans, 18 to 24, feel that Israel should be turned over to Hamas. And my second topic is going to be, uh, is anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism by definition. So those are the two topics that I'll do. Okay, should be a fantastic discussion next week. Um, so sorry about that, Harvey. I thought Mar Marilyn was just presenting next okay. week. Okay. I, I forgot you guys both do. Okay, so and with that, Dr. Stern, yeah, again, thank you very much. Um, I always learn a lot whenever uh, you present, um, whether it's on politics, China, and uh, we very much appreciate it. Um, Thank you. It's a pleasure. Was... Thanks, Thank Mark. You. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Okay. Yeah. Enjoy your uh, enjoy. Your... Okay. Enjoy your day, everyone.